Got Welcome, it. everyone. I'm joined today by my friend Oliver Bennett, who is an actor in London. And I just saw Oliver's play last week, Pass the Hat. And it stirred some sentiments within me to speak, <laughs> maybe almost with David Hume or so, or Edmund Burke. Um, and it took my fancy to some very dark, but also very uh, cheerful places while listening to him. It's a one-man play. It's just Oliver on a stage. And he relates a part of his family's story or what mm -hmm. could be or may have been his family story. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to hear perhaps what the play is about, what made you co-write the play, and then we'll see what it unearths for us here. Yes, yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Johannes, for inviting me here. Pleasure to, and thank you very much for coming to the show. It was a, a joy to have you in the audience. Um, yeah, so I'm Oliver Bennett. I'm an actor, and I co-run a company called Hunch Theatre with a uh, director called Vladimir Sherban. And we have been around for four years now, making various shows. And the, the ethos of the company was originally, and still is, to, to always work without obstacles and try and create the work that we wanted to see and particularly to mix my own background i'm from from london um and vladimir uh, is from belarus uh, originally born in ukraine actually then uh, lived in belarus and now lives in london so to sort of mix european and, and british theater but this particular show is called pass the hat and like a lot of theatre companies, we've had a strange couple of years with with COVID. The pandemic was not kind to theatre. So it was a big question of, of what would we do afterwards? What would we sort of come back uh, and do? And for years now, I've had this, this rumour in my family that I'd always wanted to investigate properly. And the rumour was that my great granddad was a very famous uh, London West End busker, this guy called Henry Hollis. And he'd written an autobiography, which I, which I have a copy of. I stole it from my mother. And I'd never actually read it and never properly investigated this. And then with the encouragement of Vladimir, he was like, yeah, you should. This could be an interesting kind of uh, show sort of woven together, exploring this whole other side of London uh, and exploring ideas of memory and identity, um, shadows. Uh, so yes, the, but the show is essentially my investigation into this guy, Henry Hollis, and I'm looking into his life, looking at his experiences, and I'm trying to work out if I am connected to him. And during the course of that, I actually uncover a lot of other stuff, a lot of surprising stuff and also uncover Henry's kind of spirit, which for me is a really important thing about the show. It's, he was a street performer from, from nothing, you know, from, from rags, ended up performing for the Queen. Uh, and everybody was sort of drawn to these guys. And they did sort of really basic stuff on the streets, uh, kind of music hall stuff, um, but it had a real energy to it. And so as an actor, particularly in the light of the last couple of years, like that idea of just just performing, you know, they're, they're, they were arrested all the time. Like nobody wanted them to perform and yet they just they just did it. And that's very inspiring. When you were saying you said there's an, another side of I mean, I'll just to comment on this briefly, only in England, you know, only in England could someone from the ranks yes. <laughs> end up performing for the Queen probably also shaking her hand, probably met with Prince Philip, I suppose, when he was yes, around Prince Soho. Philip. At the yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and this other side of London already indicates, of course, something that uh, um, there are the shadows, darkness, light and dark at play, um, even just in, in the streets of London themselves. And also mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. there, were they from East London? I think I remember you saying. Yeah, they were from Limehouse originally. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. poor, as was yeah. my granddad's family. Uh, they were definitely from the same area, whether there's a connection is slightly more hazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were from, you know, extreme, extreme poverty, basically. 
um, and were constantly getting arrested by the police. And um, and they kind of, for some reason, that that type of performance that they did attracted all different levels of society. You know, yeah, yeah, gangsters, prostitutes, and this kind of rock stars and the high level. It's weird. It just sort of something right. about it at that time as well. Sort of post-war Soho, post-war London. Yes. Uh, was actually sort of very, very lively and kind of quite equal time in some ways. Um, hierarchies were being kind of shifted around, you know. Yeah, maybe, you know, the, Prince Philip was a, a patrician. He was very, mm. you know, he was aware, of, obviously, of his, where, where he came from, but at the mm. same time, very close to um, the general people. I think he spent time every Thursday in Soho for some time, in the Thursday really? club. Yes, uh, as far as it's something I read about it. But so yeah. one thing maybe you could go into further is memory and identity and how yeah. far perhaps in uncovering or trying to uncover maybe the story, because I think your, so your grandfather's brother kept telling you that he, Henry Hollis, Horace Hollis, sorry, is he is our grand our father sorry that that's yes yeah there's yes. no question and you you have no chance you end up having no chance speaking to him mm. um but is it in in what sense do you think or was it for you that there's a connection between memory and identity mm. Mm. yeah absolutely i mean yes yeah, so it was i mean not just my granddad's brother but also my granddad would say it sometimes and sometimes not and other people in the family would say it um And actually the backdrop of the players that my granddad um, is in quite advanced stages of dementia. Yeah. Um, so that's another kind of strand of memories completely going. Uh, and from my observation of that, like identity goes as well. And so yeah. memory sort of is identity really. And as memory is so notoriously slippery and unreliable and comes in, flashes and, and and has so many shadows around it you know then then so identity must do as well i was reading this book actually while we were making the show about um uh about the zodiac killer if you know <laughs> in la in the in the 60s um it's an amazing book um called motor spirit well this american writer and he's kind of looking at people's witness statements about zodiac um And he says, you can tell like for about 24 hours, what they say is, is useful after they've had an interaction with, with Zodiac. About 24 hours, you can tell they're talking about a real person. After that, their minds have been inf infiltrated by other stories and, and the memories have just completely turned into something else. They're, they're no longer talking about a real person. They're talking about a story that's been influenced by lots of other people's ideas about it. Um, and so, yeah, so we wanted to sort of explore that and how, I mean, yeah, me memory is completely unreliable, right? Like everyone now accepts this. Um, and yet at the same time, we sort of remember what we need to remember in a way. I mean, actually it was interesting. I was just reading, um, you know, Arthur Kersler, the writer, and he, he was interested in memory and he talks about abstract memory. And he actually uses the example of a play. He says, uh, you go and see a play and you remember it, you know, an hour after, a week after, you still have a couple of images in your mind. But then like a month after, you just have a vague sort of feeling about, about what it was. Um, and that curiously sort of corresponds in reverse to the making of a play. You know what I mean? As a maker, you start with a kind of vague feeling and then you get closer to concrete things mm -hmm. and then images and then they meet the audience and then slowly over time, those fade back also into sort of uh, feelings and, and sort of more abstract kind of hunches, you know. Um, but yes, that's a bit of philosophical <laughs> rambling. Um, But yeah, what did, what did you take away from it in terms of uh, memory? One of the most striking moments in the play for me was when you tried mm. to reconstruct a th the, the, the mother of your 
grand ah, yes, yes, gr- yes, yes. Uh, your grandfather's father i think you, the my grand my grandfather's mum and a potential yes. meet yes yeah all right yes <laughs> That's yeah, family relations again. It's very complicated. Was, like, know, yeah. Right, right, right. yeah, so um using an app, funnily enough, through technology, I think you just yeah, yeah. tried to um find there's almost no photographs of her when she was younger, even though yeah, the there's technology would have been around. Her, yeah. Yeah, only one of her when she's old. So I sort of did some technological stuff to try and see what it would look like what she would look like young yeah and then and try she... to imagine her meeting this busker so there's a kind of section that's just um uh my imaginative version of their of their meeting and then i sort of undercut it and go actually there's no evidence that that ever happened actually unfortunately um <laughs> but yeah the whole the whole um we wanted to structure it myself and vladimir when we made it uh kind of constantly sort of uh picking up on the clues and taking these kind of um glimpses of connection and then they fall away again you know what i mean and we're sort of constantly going back and forth between between the two between a sort of illusion and reality all the time yes but in a way you know so we we have a notion of illusion where it's it's deceitful mm. and of course mm. th- there can be deception and there is deception um mm. But illusion, just by what the word means, is it means play. Mm, mm. It comes from ludere, Latin. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe some will have heard the notion of homo ludens, the, the playing human being. Mm. It's it is there's a playfulness between that that imagination or a certain imaginative reconstruction of what what may have been, which of course it didn't, perhaps very likely didn't happen, um, mm-hmm. but maybe nonetheless can unearth something, not something that's factually real, but in some weird way, real regardless or else novels yeah, wouldn't absolutely. make sense to us or films wouldn't absolutely. make sense to us. Yeah, or... exactly. I mean, what is, I mean, I mean theatre is complete illusion, right? It's, but it's <laughs> illusion, not in a, not in a deceptive way. Uh, in a truthful way, in a way that gets more into the truth. Like I, I stand on stage with this and you know it's a prop, right? But then I can stand on stage and tell you a story about how my granddad gave this to me and it's really precious. Um, and and he got it from his father or something like that. And so it becomes, through illusion, it can become something else. And then I could just drop it on the floor and smash it and it's just an object again, you know? By breaking it, yes. <laughs> yeah, but that's striking. That it's by breaking that you can also break the the veil around it. And mm-hmm. but what? So when you so, I think though in the this 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 play with with so something maybe that's a bit weird. But um, I suppose that we understand memory as subjective for the most part, or say personal, private, etc. But would your investigation, ultimately writing the play, putting on a show, what it does, and it, to anyone who knows London, it's it's right at the heart of so- Soho, just between Soho and Covent Garden, Leicester Square. It's uh, where all the rascals meet. And <laughs> it's in a beautiful old building. It is rather unusual for what London has become over the past 10 years, because it's not very slick at all inside, which helps the entire atmosphere of the play. Yeah, it's aura. And again, it's just, it, it's just Oliver on stage. There's, it, there's no, and it's not really a stage either. It's just, it's all on one yeah. level, which also draws. I think, yeah, it's a room. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, yeah. The, the, when is though, so, but by so your, your, Perhaps great grandfather is or was a busker, mm. but what you unearth is not again. It's not just his life. It's impossible to find out anything about this man that doesn't relate to everything all the way up to the queen in that case, uh, and mm. all the way down to the, the the swamps of East London at the time. Mm. Which they no longer are, unfortunately. Perhaps I don't know, but no. But you see, what I'm trying to say is, you you cannot 
one cannot in general isolate mm -hmm. any one life from all else that is happening. You bring in memories of, well, his presumed uh, what happened to him during the war and the mm -hmm. bombings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you, so it's all tied in. Yeah. There would be no story without that grander memory that yes, is historical I mean. for, for England. Mm -hmm. Or for Britain, you mean a kind of social, yeah, what what's happening in society, yeah, as, as a wider thing, yeah, completely, completely. And you can actually, and I'm sure every family could do that, but you can sort of read the history of the 20th century through the history of my great grandfather, through my grandfather, through my parents, through to me. Like they sort of map all of the changes uh, in the 20th century, um, and I'm sure any, you know, any. Anybody can do that with their with their family, um, particularly like in terms of class a lot, uh, and how class has changed in this country. I sort of wanted it to to touch on that, and the sort of status of the of the performer of the artist as well within that. And uh, that's always a fluctuating thing. Um, but yes, no, you're right. An, an individual life is always is always. Uh, playing against those those things or sort of with those things if you know what i mean um yeah you explained it better than me but um but yes it's all like the 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 society is sort of i suppose in a way england is sort of a character in in the play yes, as well it is yeah especially for the one me man a, show of me and england no look for me as a as a guest to this mm. fine land i've been here 10 years now it's my 10th anniversary in the year of the 17th anniversary of the Queen on the, on the throne, I'm just kidding. But look, um, sometimes and that we have common friends. I won't name, mention their names. So when we met a couple of weeks ago, I said, I, when you speak, I see this it, as a foreigner, England shines through. There's, some, there's something peculiar mm. about you know, certain, a certain lingo uh, mm. that it took me long enough to pick up on. And in your play, something similar uh, happens as well. Where it it you it's it's completely um, tied in with a grander narrative that you bring to the fore, and I think also maybe what 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 was two more trajectories you could go down towards is dementia as memory going, and what what happens when an entire culture or civilization loses its memory and becomes mm -hmm. demented, sure. and also though uh, on another because that's also important to you personally, etc. Is but also the the question: um, What does it mean to be a performer? In, mm -hmm. in in for you now, you mentioned COVID and the lockdowns in the beginning, uh, difficult to come back in some way. Um, but what what draws one out? Because this this fine Mister Henry, uh, he's something whatever it is draws him out to and this is a quite a stretch to go from limehouse to trafalgar square it's mm, not i yeah, mean yeah. back then there wasn't there wasn't the dlr train that took you there for yeah yeah they yeah, like walk in sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. there's couples of this yeah. two or three hours or so yeah, just to get yeah. there and perform they'd walk in get there and perform and and hopefully earn some money and then probably be arrested because they were technically obstructing the highway yeah. <laughs> And he was arrested nearly 600 times. And so they'd be fined each time they'd be arrested. So, you know, you're really, your margin, financial margins are kind of being cut quite, quite fine there. Um, uh, and yet still sort of needed, needed to do it. I mean, there were, there was much more of a tradition of those buskers at that time. And actually Henry comes from a, a generation of buskers. So his father was a busker and his father was a busker and all that. And they have their own language, which is very, very interesting. Um, yeah. The special busker's language, which I sort of do some of in the in the show. It's a mixture of French, Italian and Romani, like mezzas is what they call money. Um, and they have different, different words. So like a pound is a font and all that stuff. And it's, you know, like most of these languages, it's so that so that other people can't understand what they're talking about, you know. So, so there's a private, private community thing, like, like criminal, you know. I mean, they're, they're sort of, borderline criminals they were um but they're like i think of them as like weeds you know like they, they just come up from the ground somehow they push through the concrete and just appear 
you know, um, and you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. They will just like appear from the ground somehow. And yeah. that's in, in, that, in that way, they're very uh, English, as in they come from the, <laughs> from the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, from the land. It's well, just terribly let's not go. <laughs> eccentric. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, <laughs> and yes, I said, we did sort of talk about that. I spoke about that with Vladimir, the director in rehearsals, yeah. about how, um, in some ways, the my grandfather's dementia is sort of echoing a sort of kind of cultural dementia. I mean, like sometimes sort of Soho feels like it has dementia for that time, you know. Um, and Henry kind of exists at a really crucial sort of turning point because he grew up in the tradition where it's a sort of family tradition and everybody does it and everybody goes to see buskers in pubs or at the street that's just completely normal then it sort of in the 50s and 60s almost becomes like a uh, kitsch almost becomes like a tourist attraction uh, which in a way is good for him because it makes him more money and allows him to perform inside sometimes and meet more exclusive people but on the other hand everything becomes more controlled on the streets and in society so they have to be registered as self-employed uh they have to uh pay you know tax and um and all this kind of thing um and new laws come in about where you can perform and the like every time a new police chief comes in they decide they're going to clean up soho for good uh and they say to them if you if you if we arrest you one more time then you're going to prison and that's it but there was huge public outroar and they didn't they didn't do it in the end but no so through sort of through henry and and therefore through my search for being connected to henry you can sort of see increasing control in society and increasing um forgetting and 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 it's you know it is in some ways harder to be a performer within that uh because of the level of control um and yeah, I talk about in the show about how I was reading about Henry's experiences during lockdown and people, he's like talking about just performing in pubs and on the street and running away from the police. And I'm like, well, Bob, I mean, why aren't I, I doing that? I mean, I tried a little bit, but like, why, like, you know, but it would be considered weird now, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. Whereas it was, a, it was a, it was a trade. It was a profession then, you know, um, so that's interesting. I mean, of course, on the other hand, like performers, you know, there's a lot more, uh, you have a lot more advantages as well. You're protected a lot more, but it's that payoff, isn't it, between protection and, and freedom and, uh, yeah. But so did, did, do you think it would have been important for your, or is important for your own identity as a performer to maybe come from someone like him yes in some way that tradition yeah yeah I, I do feel that sometimes because i'm not from a family of of artists and performers uh, you know, my immediate family is not you know it's kind of uh safely middle class um so i always kind of wanted like that other thing you know needed to have that try, try and find that connection that, that, that kind of was important i didn't really realize that that was important to me but actually i've surprised myself that it is i, I, I want to be connected to that, to almost sort of legitimize my own um life choice <laughs> you know you you have to feel like you're coming from some kind of tradition and um and if you feel like you come from a line of performance, you know, that, that kind of gives it, gives it legitimacy. And, um, but you can sort of, I sort of conclude in the play that I, you can sort of uh, do that through illusion and imagination. You can connect yourself to certain traditions, you know, like with Punch Theatre, we've connected ourselves to sort of European theatre tradition as well, you know. Um, but yeah, I would very much like to have Busker's blood in me. But as to whether I do is is an open question still. Yeah, but it's it, I would I would I would say it's coming from a very different um, 
yeah. stance, but I, it's it's in spirit, I think, that yeah. we are speaking a bit poetically. We can be born or reborn into a certain trade or line of well of, of certain tradition. I think that's probably what what happens to poets when they mm. um, when they claim to be related to Nietzsche does this quite often. Nietzsche's friends are all dead. Nietzsche's friends are Goethe. Well actually Wagner he did meet in person, mm. but mm. he had a falling out with him of course. Uh, mm. Probably. But Goethe is his friend. Schopenhauer is his is his teacher. He never met him. Mm -hmm. um, he, Socrates is his nemesis, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Plato as well. So we can, I think, stand mm -hmm. in a deep and profound connection with with others through a again through a non personal memory. I think mm -hmm. we're then leaning into or tapping into things is the wrong word uh but um yeah we we can have a, a, a connection that's not of personal memory but one mm. that is beyond us and those that we are connected to uh which comes maybe through talent of course and then action as well or else you know mm. it would it would all just be pastiche and costume anyways um mm. but i think it, if it it can be real otherwise how, why would we i saw you in in a in a was it i think it was a russian play a right? hero of his mm -hmm. day yeah. um Lemon. yeah uh <clears throat> which speaks to us today especially at that time perhaps um when when i saw you mm. play. Uh, so how we make that connection that's the magic i would say that is yeah. that goes well beyond just the person because even if i would say um even if there is no now in your case personal direct relationship with this man there is one just by the fact that someone like him and many others from the poorer parts of this of this city that itself by the way london is very striking right you you, you said in the beginning the other side of london i didn't mention it because uh, i forgot uh but uh, to mention it then that london itself has no origin story it's entirely unclear who and when who founded and when london was founded there are mm -hmm. there are myths about it that there were two giants here gok and magok um there were there's a roman settlement here. and then it's the, all, all the uh all the, all the sort of middle english medieval poems begin with like linking brutus to, yes. to london right? yeah yeah Th that's there's a Brutus, but that's an older Brutus than the Brutus that killed Caesar. That's the Brutus from Virgil, from the Aeneas. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's, but it's R Rome. Rome has a, a clear foundation story with mm. Romulus yeah, yeah. and Remus, the two brothers yeah. fighting, yeah. very mm. symbolical, obviously, as a story. Uh, mm. And <clears throat> seven five three is before Christ, is when there's a clear number, but there isn't one. Mm. It's shrouded in darkness with with London, but so. Maybe what I'm trying to say is if it's going anywhere, I don't know. But I think what Henry made possible <clears throat> with just his, you know, no, nothing given, um, mm -hmm. goes up and, and keeps performing. He paves mm -hmm. the way for future generations to perform. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mm -hmm. even know it because why would he care? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. He, he, don't, for, he doesn't have but... time to care about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's but there are these echoes, and this is what I yeah, yeah. this was one of the most moving scenes was really when you <clears throat> describe his your again your grandfather's mother, right, uh, who left almost no trace, and it the way you described her didn't seem to want to leave a trace. Yes, 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 yes. But well, there's lots of yeah. Go on, sorry. There's lots of mysteries of, of as to what she did, you know, which kind of delve into a little bit later on in the play. But um, yes, I do get that. So there's, there's there's some people who who it seems they don't really want to leave a trace in the world, and and um, I sort of admire those people in a way, um, and that they're sort of shadowy, kind of deliberately. Um, and it is funny, kind of when you 
go down this sort of rabbit hole as people who've done personal histories, I'm sure can testify. It is very, very hard to find out basic factual information about anyone in East End of London at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, there really is not. Uh, I found many, many different sites often giving completely conditions um, completely contradictory basic information about when people were born and, and when they died and where they lived and whether they were married or not, you know. Um, it's, a very, it's a very undocumented um, uh, time and space, you know, uh, which is very, yeah, which allows the imagination to kind of, to kind of play. Um, yeah. You yes, know, London, not yeah. an origin. No, no, go on. Yeah, no, no, not gone on London if you want um, to add something. I mean, London, um, well, one of the reasons that I like Henry a lot, and actually one of the reasons that we wanted to do this story now, is that Henry is sort of, and you touched on it then, but he is kind of completely unideological. Yes. He just wants to perform. He just, yeah, he just does what he does. It's just, he just performs. That's it. Yes. He tries to make and no one tells day. him to. There's, there's nothing to it. You know, it's, there's no honors yeah, yeah. that he could get from it. No, no, nothing. He just likes to, and it's really hard, like all day, every day outside, you know, performing outside is really hard. Yeah, with know, the spoons a lot of energy. and everything. Yeah, yeah. With spoons and, you know, just doing little dances and a bass drum and, you know, quite a basic, rough, rude routines. And I like the idea of, of celebrating, you know, in the way that Nietzsche's got Wagner and Socrates. It's quite funny for me to just have a street perform, you know. And <laughs> not a great, you know, artist, but just a, just a performer. Yeah, but someone who took the, the nothing he came from and the nothing mm. he had, two spoons. Yeah. Everyone will have two spoons and they turn it yeah. into an instrument. Which in a way is how you, in, in some way, relates to identity and memory yeah. because that's how you can sort of construct your identity in some ways. From, from what's around you, from, yeah. from so, some, some fictions that are around you. Yeah. You can fashion, you know, there's a line in the play where it's to talk about fashioning an order out of the chaos. Uh, and that, uh, I suppose, a fiction and an illusion, what you would say is, is a way of fashioning an order out of the chaos and um, making that something that you can live, live by and live with and in the same way that you can pick up two spoons and suddenly art. <laughs> Yeah, but also exactly, and also the 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 journey itself from the Limehouse is very far east. For anyone who wants to look it up on a map, uh, it, just uh, probably I would guess it's a two-hour walk. I used to walk from mm. Valens Road to Bloomsbury Square. That's about an hour, mm. 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 fifty minutes on a good day. Um, yeah, yeah, and because didn't have any money. When I studied here years yeah, ago, yeah. couldn't afford the yeah, bus, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I walked yeah, yeah. Uh, to study at the library. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so if you come yeah. from, in from Limehouse, that journey itself, and you move from a very different part of this fine town, yes, to a very poor part again, to an extremely rich part where power resides as well. Around Trafalgar Square, where it's with the heart of Westminster, uh, you're very mm -hmm. close to. Mayfair and all the other places in Kensington isn't too far, etc. Uh, mm. the, the villages of the, the wealthy. Um, and he just takes it upon himself simply to, to, to go on a, on a journey every day and risk getting arrested, risk, yes. Yes. risk risking worse things, I suppose, yeah. as well. Um, yes, and probably very to, dangerous, yeah. dangerous environment as well, the West End and Limehouse would have been dangerous to walk through, you know. Um, and he just seemed to love the idea of, of meeting a crowd of people when he got there. And something about that unique interaction in that moment with, with a crowd of people was, was the meaning of life for him, you know. And that that's... was literally the meaning of life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. You know, that's just, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's enough. Yeah. You go out with two spoons and you meet others, strangers. Yeah, every yeah, single yeah, time, yeah. and you don't know what what's going to happen. There's no guaranteed outcome of that day. You know, he's yes, he doesn't know where he, who he ends up meeting again. It could yes. be Prince Philip. It could be 
some other uh, some other busker or so. Um, yes, yes, which is wonderful. Yeah. Which feels yeah. kind of ancient in a way, doesn't it? It feels sort of like I don't know. That makes me feel think of like some sort of ancient poet or artist sort of interacting yeah. with with everyone, you know, on the on the street in the in the in the commons in the um, agora or something. I suppose Trafalgar Square is the agora, right? Of yeah, of the time. Yeah, it's 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 remarkable how much that has been that has been lost, I would say, uh, in, in our time. I think that's remarkable, how much that's uh, changed, how streamlined things are, really, in, in almost yes. everything. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately, this is something I will have to think about more, what that will do also to, to memory. Because in some sense, if we think, you know, we started this with saying memory <clears throat> is inaccurate, but maybe all the accuracy we have of memory uh, with being able to take pictures of everything, recording this <laughs> and other things, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just maybe is also just a, a tremendous burden. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm becoming almost nostalgic for a London I've never known. But yes, that's, yeah, that's, me too. That's, I've never known. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, it, but, it, but in some sense, you know, that's what I at least thought I was able to see during the play is that it came it is somewhat still hidden there there's a moment when you open the curtain and that's almost mm-hmm. a you 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 know you're breaking something in the stage yeah. because so again it's a room it's not a, 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 a real theater uh in that sense and there's a it's an, i think it's the first or second floor and yeah. when you when you open the curtain, you just look outside over to and you see, I think, uh, Bloom, well, not Bloomsbury, uh, it's, 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 it's Shaftesbury Avenue. Is, um, Shaftesbury Avenue. Shaftesbury Avenue is right there. It's Cambridge Potter. Square, isn't it? Is it Cambridge, Cambridge Square? Square. Yeah, yeah, Cambridge yeah, Square. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that coincides. Would... We do that in the play when, when Henry is going to the West End for the first time. And so, yeah, it's a lovely moment that Vladimir came up with of, of uh, you know, we're probably like, 15, 20 minutes into the play at that point, And you've sort of had like me being me. And then we've gone into Henry. So you've got these sort of layers of illusion and then suddenly real. There's actual Shaftesbury Avenue and Cambridge Circus literally there now, you know? Um, so it's a very nice, yeah, it's a very nice, it's a kind of breaking of a sort of fourth wall um, with space rather than with the audience, you know? Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, I don't know about, I don't really hang around West End and Soho enough now to know if there's still a live sort of uh, vibrant culture there. Do you? No, <laughs> no, I don't. But at least, you know, at least during the play, it's some, something came back because walking through a city, this is also this is a you know very personal phenomenological i i can i can say phenomenological and it sounds more important uh but when i was i spent some significant time in canada and in mm. the pacific northwest for example seattle and it, seattle is not a very old city and you you it it felt as the walking on or in wilderness which a city like Rome or London doesn't. You're walking through layers and layers and layers of history just by the architecture. So we are in some weird sense, perhaps, walking through different uh, times anyway, yes. all different generations, yes. etc. And theatre or poetry, they can bring some of it back sometimes. Yes, completely. completely. And then remind us, but also open us up to something in our time. You know, so mm-hmm. just speaking to you, you, this the danger that's inherent in Henry's just everyday life that's mm-hmm. that's present. That the the threat he just perfectly willingly seems to be just you know one just doesn't really care. This is what he needs to do. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And that that drive and everything that is striking and also maybe on you, you mentioned the Basque language in the play mm. what's the line again that you say there 
Vada the, the Bona Palerna with the Bona Scotches, you jags. Which means <laughs> Vada means look, Bona means good, Palerna means girls, Scotches means legs, Jags means friends, so it means look at that girl's lovely legs, mate. They've got their own hey. secret language. Yeah, secret language. <laughs> there you go. That's what we yeah. need more of. Yeah, yeah, more, more secret languages. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, maybe that will, maybe that will develop more <laughs> private <laughs> languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, no, it's completely true. I mean, didn't Freud say that the Rome, you know, is like the layers of subconscious and the older buildings are like the vestigial subconscious stuff and... um so in a way, delving into the history of a city is a kind of psychotherapy in some way, psychologically sort of significant for the individual and, and generations as well. Um, so, yeah, when you walk, you are sort of going back in time and moving, moving back in time. And, and yeah, no, I hope, hopefully art can, can really smash that, smash that barrier down. Um, yeah. Yeah. And allow you, I, like ideally allow you to sort of, you know, because after the audience come out of the show, they will literally be walking back into, onto the West End. Um, and yeah, I like to think that they see it with, with new eyes and, and um, be sort of temporarily confused as to what time they're in. <laughs> yeah, which can only be helpful given, given how much it's being dismantled with new architecture that's coming in. But oh, that's for yes, different, yes. different uh, times. Yeah, I don't know perhaps. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's devastating to see what they've done to Denmark Street, where oh, all Denmark the great. Oh my god, I still remember that. Like even in my, even lifetime. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> even I mean, I've I've only been here ten years. years. Yeah, I, yeah, used, yeah. I, I used to get my guitar repaired there. They've kicked out. He 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 quit. They've kicked him out. So it's all. And there was Enterprise Studios, this place just sort of behind Denmark yeah. Street, a club called, uh, can't remember what it was called, but I used to play there because I was in bands and things like that. And Enterprise Studios, like the Sex Pistols rehearsed there. And um, I was actually rehearsing there once and I met the uh, the Slits, if you remember them, a punk band. Uh, they were rehearsing in there and I met them. And you could literally rehearse for like, you know, a few quid, And you can rehearse for like for like hours in that. Yeah, it's completely gone now. No, no, that is that is terrible. That is terrible. And the problem is, if you sort of defend it, you sound like a nostalgic, old, grumpy, fogey. Um, well, yeah. But it is also just objectively bad that it's gone. Yeah, no, it is. And I'm yeah. not. What am I nostalgic for? I I don't know the place. Didn't know the place as a child. Mm. I have no family mm. connection to it, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. but but something in what makes the heart of London is mm -hmm. has been disappeared, you could almost say. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so it, it, I think that's why especially play plays like this engagements with the past in this way that are not purely informational, you know, that's not factual, yes. but playful again, um, mm -hmm. unearthing mm -hmm. something, imagining the rest. Um, even if There's ultimately an aporia almost in the end as to, you know, uh, uh, the path ends and we don't know. Yes, he was actually my great grandfather. Or no, he wasn't because I don't really think it's, we don't really find out. But mm -hmm. it's not even necessary mm -hmm. to find out because the path itself, trying to find out who this man was in his time and who he has met and what it, it would have probably I would assume have changed you in a certain way. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's kind of ambiguous because at the end, in some ways, the message, in some ways, the message of the play is it's good to forget. Yes. In some way. <laughs> or I went into subtitle it in praise of repression or in praise of forgetting. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's ambiguous. Yeah, of course, to, to sort of personally, sometimes to forget traumatic things is entirely good um, and to, to sort of not unearth them and remember them. Um, and I suppose that's why I was struck 
looking at my grandparent, look, well, looking at my granddad, delving into his history and uh, and that generation of how much the the ideal was to to forget um, and to move on. That was the virtuous, you know, not to kind of, um, you know, I mean, they would never have heard of psychotherapy. They would never have dreamed of doing that. It was just not what you would do. You have to be stoical and just and just and just move on. Put your energy into into moving on, um, and just kind of closing the past actually in a personal way. So I can, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of, uh, hopefully it's kind of interestingly ambiguous um, in terms of forgetting and remembering. Like, uh, it's very Nietzschean. Maybe I can just oh, add really? this. Yeah, there's a... What way? Um, there was a tradition in, in Tremony at the time, well, before Nietzsche, it's called his, Historismus Historicism, which I think Herder was connected to and a few others. Uh, mm. um, Spengler would Speng, Spengler is much later, but he, so is, is this attempt to, no, to first to find wie es eigentlich gewesen ist, what it's actually been like, what it's really been like, what it really was, and find all the data, all the information, all the facts, etc. Categorize mm. them. Spengler goes as far as Spengler is not a historicist, but but comes from that tradition. Uh, and he wants to write the future even and, and categorize everything down to its core of the past of all cultures and civilizations that came before from mm. just about anywhere. Um, and Nietzsche is somewhere in between that. So one of his early essays is on the use and abuse of history for life. Mm. And he mm. says that the only way in which history makes sense for us is in what he calls monumental is when we look back on figures that are, or yeah, or events that are, for him it's mostly individuals who are influential, important, inspiring. And we accept, well, we, we affirm certain of, a certain, well, some of their characteristics, certainly not all of them, and use them for, for us, for our time, for our future. And the worst part is to be either is to be just backward looking um, antiquarian and yeah, antiquarian yeah. in a sense, be collecting everything because it, it suffocates life today. It, it, mm, it, mm. it forgets to forget as it were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So without forgetting yeah. to, to make it simple, without forgetting, we have no future. We need mm -hmm. to forget mm -hmm. to a certain Absolutely. degree. Did he say that? Without forgetting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, that's a, like that. it's a summary, uh, uh, but mm. yeah, you, you can read it in that essay that for forgetting is very important to also, yeah, he calls forgetting divine in one of the mm. um, posthumously published notes. Um, mm. And Goethe has a maxim somewhere in his maxims and reflections where he also says that um, sometimes we just want to relieve ourselves from, from history, from mm. the burden mm. from just mm, mm. yeah so in some mm. degree forgetting is important but at the same time it a change so I, but i would say though you know that because th this is not to say we don't we shouldn't have we should have no memory of anything no but we this mm -hmm. it should be a memory that's a, that comes to life if it's just look if you had just been sitting there saying henry was born on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then he moved to this blah blah there's no there's there's no story there's no play there's there's it's just factual information nothing yeah, arises yeah, nothing yeah. emerges nothing comes to life and if you you could have you could have made it even shorter and say well actually there's no story because i don't even know so there's no evidence hence why who am i to say anything so it would have died in the womb it would have been over yeah yeah but that's not that's exactly this kind of informational factual dealing yes. with memory that kills everything to yes. speak bluntly while letting something come alive in a certain ambiguous way because it's simply it is ambiguous because we yes. are ambiguous creatures and who knows himself but i yeah, have no clue what i thought yesterday you know i know what i drank this morning probably coffee mm -hmm. um but it, it's so th this is this way of bringing something to life that i think is what what 
I I saw in it. Um, yes, absolutely. But at the same I mean, time, yeah, sorry, go on. Well, in a certain sense, we're sort of saying um, by putting the play on now and by investigating this guy, Henry, and this tradition, um, we are implicitly saying there's something about the spirit of this of this guy um, that we need now or that it would be interesting to have now, right? That's kind of the implicit message of the play because I'm wanting to make myself connected to it spiritually or ancestrally. Um, and that's very much, you know, theatre, particularly post-pandemic theatre, it's, it's very, very hard to do. Um, and we need more spaces um, and more, um, need more, more people taking a, taking a punt and doing crazy theatrical events. I think that would be, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, there've been a few sort of articles written about, the state of theatre recently, quite a lot actually, quite a bit, but some of which have been quite interesting. Um, and and, and theatre is really hard because you need people and money and space, you know, which is hard to kind of kind of get. It doesn't it doesn't work online at all, which is why we decided not to do things online uh, during the pandemic and did a couple of live performances. So so it's a sort of quiet, subtle call to arms to 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 make some kind of more live theatrical events um and if we could make that cool again if yes. we could make sort of theater cool yeah. again and weird and again and weird absolutely yeah. make it we would make it strange um then then i think that would be that would be something um and that's what we yeah we at hunch theater are definitely trying to trying to do that it's one of the most beautiful English words. Weird. Weird. After, yeah. <laughs> after, after word comes weird. He used it. When it was still spelled with a Y. Uh, it, has, right. it has to do with fate also. Mm, yeah, the weird And a sisters, certain yeah. sending. So if, if anything mm. good comes from, from these past two years of lockdown, they are as Zora in a certain sense, right? They, they do allow us to, uh, if not, uh, I don't like the word reset, but... Uh, they do us allowed to uh, to to because reset means go back to the past. Actually, yeah, it's a weird word. Be be but reset means go back to default original yeah, setting. It, yeah, it is. Yeah, but even setting is also very technical, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is it, it, it shouldn't. So I I wonder what you know people have said it could be a renaissance, a coming of a golden age, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a, a rebirth. Certainly, if, if that's what Renaissance means, a rinascimento, uh, that's certainly, that, that's maybe more mm. pregnant in, in meaning than just a, a reset or so. But it is, it, it is not a going back to zero either. But mm. in that, it's very significant what you said there now here, that it's post-pandemic theater. So you're bringing this to life or to the stage now to remind yourself maybe and and and, mm -hmm. and others in 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 your space and also the audience what is possible mm -hmm. what can also be theater and what can be brought to life so it's it mm -hmm. is that, that that's i think how we anyone who's trying to do anything um mm -hmm. artistically mm -hmm. creatively intellectually should should use this 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 extreme cut that we've been through mm -hmm. and mm -hmm let it bleed out but then you know let's see what what grows from the wound or so <laughs> yeah you know, <laughs> that's a good way of, that's a good way of putting it what grows from the wound um yes absolutely because most theater has just sort of stayed the same it's been sort of kept alive yeah, artificially and it's yeah. just yeah, yeah it's just you know and everybody knows it and and there are there are deep issues in terms of funding and funding organizations and criteria and all that kind of stuff which is yes we we'll get into but um but if, the, if if there was a spirit that it could be that it could be at least theoretically could be exciting again and a place for uh actually i um you know it was, it was world theater day uh recently and last year in world theater day i found Jean Cocteau's original speech. He gave the first ever World Theatre Day speech. And he talks about how everybody's saying theatre's 
dead you know this was in the early 60s you know the machines killed theater and he says fine fine so be it you know um he said but if if theater is dead long live theater as we say of, of kings you know uh and he says you know theater can be like a, a living university where you where you meet in flesh and blood people from the past and and people from extreme different life experiences um it still has that still has that power Excellent. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you very much. And um, should I say, yeah, people should check out uh, Hunch Theatre um, on our on our social media and the show Pass the Hat and look for when we are when we are playing that show particularly. Thank you. <laughs>